Well, hello, hello, hello. Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to Central Christian Church. It is so good, like uh, Ruth just said, it is so good to have you guys here in the house today. And uh, if you're here in these pews, we're glad you're here. If you're online, we're glad you're with us. If you're on TV, we're glad that you're with us. If you're new, we have this place uh, called the Blue Room, and it's part of this new um, kind of like pathway to engagement, pathway to like connection here at Central that James told you about last week. But if you're new here, stop by the Blue Room on your way out today. Uh, stop there for two minutes. Let us give you a gift and say hello. And then the next step is this thing that we're calling 20 Start, which is just uh, literally 20 minutes where you can uh, hear what we believe and why we believe it and what we do, why we do it. Some of the surface level basics of Central. And that happened like an hour ago, so you missed it. Uh, uh, you, the, but we're doing it on the first Sunday of every month. And so uh, if you missed it this time, we had 23 people in there this time through. So that's pretty cool. Um, but if that's you, uh, if you are just l looking for that next level information, make sure you put it on your calendar now to go to 20 start at 1025 on the first Sunday of every month or, or next month. Merry Christmas. That's crazy enough as, as it is. Last weekend, Trevor started our new Christmas series where we are looking at some familiar people and parts of the Christ-centered Christmas story, the real Christmas story, but we're hoping to take like some like less than common angles at this story. We're looking to gather some lessons from like not just the surface, but by reading between the lines. And like we told you, this is a Christmas series, so we're calling it Between the Pines. Last week, Trevor talked to us about Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, and uh, much the same. We're looking at another familiar character today. We're talking about the classic story of Anna. Anna, I mean, like it's Mary, Joseph, Jesus, the wise men, the shepherds, and Anna. On the count of three, let's all yell out our favorite thing about Anna. One, two. No, I'm just kidding. I think, I think a lot of people are like, who's Anna? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, Anna. Uh, so Anna herself is really kind of a, a between-the-lines character in the Christmas story. She's really not well-known, and, I mean, for good reason. There's only three verses in the entire Bible where Anna is referenced. Her story takes place in the temple in Jerusalem. When Jesus was eight days old, his earthly mom and dad, his Mary and Joseph, took their son, Jesus, to the temple in Jerusalem because it was a custom of that day to dedicate your firstborn son and to offer a sacrifice to God on behalf of your firstborn son. So Jesus no different than any other firstborn son. Mary and Joseph took him to the temple in Jerusalem. And while they're there, we meet uh, a bunch of different folks. And one of those people that they come across in this time in the temple is, in fact, Anna, who we're talking about today. Let me read you the three verses from Luke chapter 2 where Anna is mentioned. This is verse 36. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. And that's it. That's all we know. That's all we read about Anna. Three verses. And in the context of, like, the Christmas story found in Luke chapter 2, it is easy just to read right over those three verses and miss her altogether. But when we really look, when we read between the lines, I think God has some big lessons from this little stretch of Scripture. If you were going to caption Anna's life, I think the caption of her life would be devoted. You would have liked her. I would have 
liked her. She had a a positivity all the way through her life. She was the kind of person who, you know, she didn't say, I can't believe I only got three verses in the Bible. Anna had the kind of like perspective where she'd be like, I can't believe I got three verses in the Bible. I picture Anna like a lot of the women of that day growing up. She had big dreams and big plans. She was a little Jewish girl who had dark hair and dark eyes. And you just looked at her, you could see the life inside of her in her eyes. She liked to laugh and play and run on the dusty roads of Jerusalem with her friends. She was a carefree kind of a spirit. She had a contagious smile. You couldn't help but like being around her. She would hang out with her friends, and they would hope for a long life, and together they would imagine their future. You know, they're playing around the rock with their little dolls, and they would talk about their husbands, like what what might their husband do for a living, what what their last name might become, what their futures would look like. They would name their children, you know, like little girls do. They would sit around and talk about all that life had ahead. Well, before long, all of that dreaming kind of became reality because little Anna grew up and got married and started living out all of those plans that she had made. But before long, the bottom fell out and Anna's world was rocked. Because after being married for only seven years, her husband dies. Was it an accident that took him? Was it some sort of sickness that he contracted that he fought with for a while, but sooner than later he died because of, I don't know. But I do know that they were young and in love, and the brutal stab of death struck too soon. And at a young age, Anna experienced tragic loss. This was crushing to Anna because... This is an era where everything about her was wrapped up in the man who just died. Her her future hopes, her future children, all of her income and money, all of her identity was wrapped up in her husband. This is a real point in her life where there is potential for a turning point in the wrong direction. Sadness could sweep over her and not just like stick with her for a minute. It could overwhelm her for the rest of her life. The joy that she was known for, the smile that she grew up with could fade from her face and stay gone because of this hardship that she's going through right now. And this is where we learn our first lesson from Anna. In her time of tragedy, In her moment of heartbreak and deep disappointment, Anna turned to God and kept turning to God. Because from this point forward, from this tragic moment forward, Anna finds her identity in God. If she was married when she was 14 years old, which was pretty common at that time, and then they were married for seven years, and we know from this scripture that she's 84 at this point in the temple, we know that for 60 plus years after this tragedy, Anna lived as a widow, not bitter and angry, but constantly serving God in the temple. The Bible tells us that she's found in the temple day and night, fasting and praying, no doubt serving God, leading other people, sharing her story, mentoring other young women, never forgetting her pain, but never forfeiting an opportunity given to her. Sometimes pain blinds us. It's just what it does in our human condition. I mean, it's like a, a blanket over your eyes. It's all you can think about. You can't remember what it was like before. You can't picture what it'll be like In the future, it is just all you can see and think about and talk about, and your pain becomes all-consuming, and your struggle ends up stealing something that God has for you even in your circumstance. Because in and through, after all that's going on, God still has big plans for you. 
And so, like Anna, we're human beings, and we're not going to forget our pain, but also like Anna, we need to learn a lesson from her and ask God for the strength to keep our eyes open to opportunity, even in the midst of our struggle. All the time, I talk to people in our community or in our church who have just been hit with, like, some horribly hard times, death disease, diagnosis, job change, job loss, financial status change, trying to figure your way through that. People fighting depression or sometimes worse, a a family member who is struggling with debilitating depression. Your kids are going through like serious issues. Your friendships are struggling. Your marriage is falling apart. You feel like you have been wronged by life. And it is in these moments that we rarely stay the same spiritually. It's in these times where we're either going to turn to our faith or away. We're going to turn toward God or we're going to walk away. It is rare to stay the same in those moments. And I'm reminded of James chapter 4, verse 8. It says this, come near to God, and he will come near to you. I think at, at face value, surface level, we can read that and think like, well, we've got to take the first step. God's only going to respond to, to what we do. And I don't think, I mean, I think reading between the lines of that scripture, I don't think that that scripture is saying we have to come near to God, and then he'll decide to draw near to us. He never changes. He couldn't love you more than he does right now. He couldn't do more than he's already done to be near to you than he has done at this point. But it's when we decide to turn toward him like Anna did, when we turn toward our faith, toward our God, we realize we have a a different kind of understanding just how close he is and has been even in the midst of our struggle. Psalm 34 promises that Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. And I know that I know that I know that there are people in this room, people online right now, people at home on your couch right now, in a hospital bed right now. I know there are people who would classify themselves. You'd put yourself in that category. I am somebody whose spirit is crushed. I would be considered brokenhearted. If you're in that place, look, I know you hear me talk. You know this line I'm talking about where you're tempted. Everything in you wants to walk away from your faith. You want to turn from God because you're angry, you're confused, you don't understand, you're, you're physically and emotionally hurting right now. I'm praying for you in Jesus' name that you somehow experience this supernaturally sourced strength to turn to God even in your hardest heartbreak moment. Matter of fact, would you just, let's, let's pray right now for those people, okay? Would you join me in praying? For those folks. Heavenly Father, you know far better than I the people who are struggling right now. People who have hit a really hard time and they have a hard time seeing anything else. God, you are good. Your kindness draws us to you. And so, Father, I pray that even today, on this day, this day would be a a moment that is remembered by those folks as a time when they feel a different kind of awareness of your nearness. Even in the struggle, in the heartache, in the hurt, in the confusion, God, would you be so near that it's unmissable for those people? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, in the end... Anna's life of devotion on earth was, in fact, rewarded on earth. She was allowed the glimpse of the Savior, the one that she had heard about and talked about, read about, studied about, prophesied about. She was given the gift of being one of the first human beings on the planet to see the Christ child and understand who he was, understand that this child was the Messiah. And even though she had 
been through some really tough days in life, she didn't like take this joyful moment and say, I am do this. God, you owed me this one. Thank you for this reward. I'm going to keep this joy all to myself. No, no, no. You remember verse 38? Verse 38 said that Anna began praising God and talked to everyone. She started sharing the good news. I think we can take a note from Anna. We can do a a better job sometimes talking about the good things that God has allowed us. We can share the blessings. We can speak about his goodness and provision better than we do sometimes. You know, I'm glad that he allows us those blessings. I'm glad that he gives us the good things. But everybody in this room Everybody online, every person watching on TV right now, you need to hear this. I need, we need to hear this because this is the message of Anna. Anna's belief and deep devotion was not contingent on her blessing. Her belief and her devotion was not contingent on her blessing. She did not wait until she saw the good thing to do the godly thing. She didn't withhold her life of devotion until she knew that there was a reward on the path. She devoted her life regardless, and as a matter of fact, she dove into her devotion at her point of loss. And then she showed that commitment, that devotion, for the next 60 plus years, and she was going to one way or the other no matter what. And this moment of blessing was just a bonus in her life. Sometimes... We can get caught in the trap of give to get. I'm going to serve to be seen. I'm going to contribute when it benefits me. That's not what real devotion, that's not what Anna-like devotion looks like. Real devotion can be spoken about in the fair weather, but real devotion is only seen in the storm. True devotion is showing up to serve when it is not convenient on your calendar. Real devotion is joyfully giving from a place of trust in the God who says that he will provide. Real devotion is the husband who day in and day out takes care of his wife who has gone through chemo treatment after chemo treatment after chemo treatment and her body has been ravaged in a way where she has really no capacity to give anything in return but he cares for her at all hours because he is devoted to his wife and to his marriage real devotion is the family who just lost a loved one, and they're sad about it, but they still believe in the goodness of God that they have devoted their life to. And so even as the casket lid closes, the family sings songs of faith, even at the funeral. True devotion is digging deep and turning to your faith, turning to God, leaning into him in the triumphs and in the trials, regardless of our situation. God wants and deserves our our commitment when you see the good thing and in the 63 years in between when you don't see anything, when you don't feel anything. Sometimes your earthly devotion will be rewarded with something on earth like Anna's was. Other times it won't be, and that's not a cop-out. That's just reality. The Bible talks about a ton of people who lived lives devoted to God but did not see the full reward on earth. Hebrews chapter 11 lists a bunch of those folks, people that we would consider like biblical pillars of the faith, names that we would recognize, famous people, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Samuel, King David and others, heroes of the faith who lived devoted to God but never experienced the full reward this side of heaven. 
But just because they didn't experience the full reward didn't change God's desire for them to live a life fully devoted to Him. It doesn't change God's desire for us to live a life fully devoted to Him. He wants us to live for Him day and night, good and bad, whether our earthly, or whether our reward is on earth or it's in heaven. He wants us to be devoted to Him regardless of what happens on this level. 1 Kings 8 spells out what God's desire is for each and every one of us. May your hearts be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and his commands. So we're going to go into our ministry time in just a minute. I want to invite you to come and pray at these steps about, I mean, it could be anything that's on your heart or mind today. Maybe you're coming today. And asking God to help you feel a a, a greater sense of awareness of his presence in your life. Maybe you're asking him for the strength to turn toward him in your circumstance. Maybe you're coming to praise him, to ask him to help you speak of the good things a little better. For some, I know that the Christmas season is a reminder of the hard things that we've been through. Maybe the hard things that you're going through right now. For you, I pray that the story of Anna is an encouragement to you to hold on, to do what you can to decide to turn toward your faith, to turn toward your God, even in this tough season. For some of us, the story of Anna might be a reminder that we need to do a better job talking about the blessings that he does allow us to see. But more than anything, The the between-the-lines story of this woman named Anna is a story that invites all of us, everyone, young and old, to live our entire life beginning to end, fully determined to be fully devoted to the Savior that this season is really all about. Would you stand and come and pray as we sing this song together? Is the evergreen mm-hmm. This is the evergreen Your holy presence Living in me This is my daily This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me, and I.
pray that we would believe those words. And that without you, we are lost. And I pray for desperation for you to rise up in us. God, light a new fire in us. Give us new energy, a new hunger for a closer, deeper relationship with you. Father, you are all we need. Would we lean on that? Not the things that everyone tries to throw at us, but God, that we would lean on you. And I pray that you would help us to lay down our pride and declare our need for you. And we try to do so much on our own without you. We try to carry so much on our own without you. God, give us a spirit of humility, a spirit that's willing to say, Father, I need you. Father, I'm lost without you. Father, I pray that the breath that you put in our lungs, we wouldn't waste. We wouldn't take them for granted. We wouldn't miss opportunities. But God, that anyone that comes in contact with us would be changed because of you, because of the change that you have made in our lives, the difference that you have made in our lives. God, I'm praying that you use us God, we thank you for an opportunity to gather together to praise your name, the name above every name, the name that is worthy of our praise. God, will we never take that for granted? Will we never go through the motions in your presence? God, we declare that you are worthy of it all. Help us to live like we believe that. You're a good God. You're a faithful God. You're trustworthy. We thank you that you are who you say you are and that you will do what you say you will do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you all for choosing to worship here today. Uh, if there's anything that you want prayer about, anything you want to talk about, I would encourage you, as John has mentioned, head to the Blue Room. If this is your first time here, we would love to meet with you. John and the crew are in there. They'd love to meet with you. And as Chapel said, don't forget, be back here in this room at 6 p.m. tonight. We'll see you there.